Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you staying inside on this beautiful day. Uh, my name is Natan Edelsberg. Um, back in New York, I run a tech company. We do Muckrack and the Shorty Awards. And I'm also here for foundremote.com covering the future of TV, which is exactly what we're here to talk about. Um, so MIP, MIP TV this year has made a great investment in teaching everyone more about the state of VR. And I think a lot of the times we're often um, you know, experiencing these big headsets and lots of great hardware and one-time experiences. Um, but what we believe the future of VR is when it really comes to social VR. And so we've put together a really amazing panel with three of the top companies innovating in social VR today that you're going to meet very shortly. Um, so we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump right into it. Um, but just so you know, all four of us will be right outside in the lounge to answer questions in more details and have a chat for those that would like to. And we'll also try and leave a couple of minutes for questions um, from the audience right here. Um, so thank you again, and without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Jane to introduce herself and talk about Altspace. Great, thank you so much. My name is Jane Fang. I'm the Director of Business Development for Altspace VR. We are based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and Altspace VR is a social VR communications software company. So that's a mouthful, but um, what it means is we don't make the hardware. We make a cross-platform social uh, VR application. And what do people use it for? We like to you know, think of ourselves as a place where people can hang out when they can't physically be there together. So imagine playing either a card game with you know someone you know from uh, America or you are uh, visiting a, a Mayan maze and, and trying to get your way out of it with a few colleagues from all over the world. We're also really well known for our marquee events. So whether it's a concert or a comedy show or uh, we did a big partnership with NBC News around programming around the US presidential election this fall. So going to watch the debates together, for example, those live events are all things that you know we do um, and, and, and do it, and the whole point is you can do it with others. Um, and, you know, we're about 40 people, and, uh, you know, some of our investors include, include Google and Comcast and Tencent. Great. Thank you very much, Jane. And Fabrice. Hi, Fabrice from LiveLike. I'm a head of production and uh, co founder. LiveLike uh, helps broadcasters basically bring some of the you know, top uh, premium properties from sports to virtual reality. Uh, it involves both production, but also reusing all the content uh, that they have. And we offer it as white label solution or even SDK so you can actually bring it into your existing mobile application. Um, we've done uh, quite a few events uh, like Super Bowl or Premier League or Bundesliga, uh, over 50 live events today, uh, different sports too. Um, and, uh, and basically we have four pillars that we sort of base our experience. One is immersivity, second is the content richness of television, so not putting aside all the TV content. Uh, third one is interactivity uh, of sort of second screen. And third one is social. Uh, and the fourth one is social. Julian. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Julian Price. Um, I'm one of the original founding team and chief marketing officer for VTime, um, which I'm sorry, Nathan, I have to take slight uh, issue with the title of the session, which is we believe the future of VR is sociable, not social, because uh, we position ourselves as the world's first sociable network. I'll take the fall on that okay, one. Okay, okay. Um, and let, uh, joking aside, let me explain the difference, because uh, we believe current social networks, Facebook, Twitter alike, uh, are mostly asynchronous networks where you post something, somebody comes later and answers and so on and so forth. So they may be social, but they're not very sociable. Um, whereas we believe virtual reality is very sociable. Uh, it is an ideal technology with which to meet with your friends and family, whoever you like from anywhere in the world, uh, and to chat and share. And that's exactly what VTime is. Uh, VTime has been out as an app now for just over a year. Um, we've had well over half a million downloads. We've got oh, hundreds of thousands of active users in 195 different countries of the world. So uh, we've got quite a good spread already. Uh, and VTime is all about doing what I just said, which is in lovely virtual environments, uh, going places and doing things you can't do in real life. There's no point in making it real because that would be real reality. This is virtual reality. Uh, but we're using the technology, we're using the virtual reality technology to allow people to do 
what people have always done, which is to meet up together, to chat, to ch sing songs around the campfire, to share stories, to share pictures, and so on and so forth. At the moment, you can um, curate your friends list, you can meet and share pictures, you can sit in the middle of your own 360 photography, so you can share 360 photos you've taken, and very soon we're going to be bringing streaming media, uh, video, uh, movies, TV, and such like into VTime, so you'll be able to be sociable around those. Thank you. Looks like we ended in a virtual can there. So <laughs> next time, none of us will actually be here. We'll, we'll just be... <laughs> I have actually done one of these Q&A sessions in V-Time on nice. the stage. It didn't go quite as planned. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think the first question I wanted to ask each of you, I think when I first started experiencing your technologies and learning about them, I first thought of the movie WALL-E, you know, where future humans are sitting in a spaceship, not really moving much, just experiencing these unbelievable virtual worlds. But as I talked to each of you more, I, I started to learn about different ways that this is actually helping people that have maybe never before actually started to be more sociable, to interact with each other, and it's actually, in a sense, getting us to be less disconnected. Um, so I was curious if each of you can maybe let me know if you agree or disagree with that and speak to maybe why that's happening. Yeah, Jane, we can start with you. Yeah, sure. I think um, with the power of VR hardware, there are certain things you can do that are super, super immersive and make it feel like more like you're face to face with someone than if you were just on the phone or even Google Hangouts or FaceTime with them. There's nonverbal communication, which really goes a long way to creating a sense of presence. We first met in VR and chatted for about an hour in one of Altspace VR's virtual uh, environments. We um, only met in person today. We only met in person today, but we've, we've met for a whole hour in, in virtual reality. And there are simple things that go a long way, like eye contact. You, I can actually use VR technology to point, and you know exactly that I'm pointing back here. Uh, there's uh, you know, my, my uh, head position. If I'm looking away, if I'm looking at you, we can move around a space. All those things just make it much more enriching and enjoyable than just a f verbal co uh, conversation. And we've seen um, just you know, two anecdotes that come to mind with, with, with regards to connecting people. Uh, we have a weekly Wednesday night DJ party in Altspace VR to become the party to, to attend every Wednesday night. And we have had users who've written on Reddit or contacted us who said they've used that to overcome social anxiety. They couldn't go to a party in real life and that very safe environment really helped them overcome something that you know they uh, typically would not have been able to do um, similarly you know we've had folks with um, you know disabilities who can't leave their homes who uh, who who, uh, who spend all of their time interacting with other people through Altspace VR, right? So those kind of stories are, are just uh, part of, uh, one of the great reasons why we do what we do because it's uh, it, it's so enriching to, to be able to fulfill goals like that for our users. And, and Julian, you know, the sports, watching sports is already a very social experience. I mean, people get together and I noticed how, you know, part of the features is being able to kind of watch a game together and enjoy it together. So do you feel the same kind of things are happening? So, um, yeah, we, we obviously have a brief, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're in sync. So the, um, our use case is obviously very specific, but also very interesting because it's very recurring. Uh, obviously one of the things in sports that's very interesting is, um, you know, a lot of people ideally would love to go to the stadium, but it's not always convenient or affordable uh, or possible because in the end the stadium can only contain, you know, bring so many people together. Um, and like I said a little bit earlier, I think we're really trying to make it a unique experience by combining uh, the richness of content of television, the sort of presence of being at the stadium, and then the social experience and interactive experience that I think only VR can really offer. So I think together uh, what Live Like is, is, is you know, offering through the broadcaster or the, that we work with is really a unique experience. And then we're always like every sports obviously is gonna be a little bit different because uh, one thing that we, we've done I think pretty well so far is really to always focus on, on the user experience in the sports and really um, from there work the best possible experience and, and every sport is going to be very different. Uh, so 
that, that's very interesting. And the social is something that we're launching uh, at Roland Garros, uh, 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 unless we have something before. But uh, so uh, definitely check it out if you're uh, if you have the opportunity. Uh, Roland Garros, our French Open uh, this year. Um, you'll be able to watch with your friends and enjoy it. Um, it'll be uh, the whole court uh, Philippe Chatrier. And uh, so that'll be an exciting time. Bring your friends. And, and with the French Open quickly, like, do you need the exclusive rights to an event like that? Or is it more an added experience to the main broadcast? Um, so we're basically our service provider for the French Tennis Federation, yeah. who's offering that as an added uh, service uh, to the broadcast rights they have, so as an extra platform. And I think that's definitely a model that we're you know uh, pushing. So you're not uh, competing for streaming rights or broadcast. Exactly, rights. we're not. Uh, for example, like Next VR, who might be doing B two C and wants to be sort of the you know, Netflix of sports for VR, basically. So a very different approach and business model. Uh, we're working with either the federation or the broadcaster in uh, providing them uh, the platform for bringing their content. And we do, we can do the capture. So in most cases, just because we, we needed to be able to innovate on the whole workflow, we actually uh, do the capture as well. Um, but we are also very flexible. So sometimes we work with broadcasters who have already like, you know, like crews on the ground and already want to cover some some aspect of the event uh, in VR and we'll just work with them on, on that, so. Great. Yeah. The actual Julian. Yes, <laughs> the actual Julian. Um, I, mean, I, I completely agree with, with Jane and I don't think it's the reason that any of us set up these businesses, but it, it doesn't half warm your heart when you come into work in the morning and you open an email that says, thank you for doing your software, you've saved my life. Uh, you know, which we have had from somebody uh, who was involved in an accident and was left paralyzed from the neck down uh, and has been using V-Time to communicate with his family. That's fantastic when, when you get that. Also, we're working closely with the National Health Service in the UK to look at, uh, as Joe mentioned, it's ideal for people with social phobias uh, and we're looking at ways of providing uh, remote counseling services uh, to those patients. Um, so I think all of those things are brilliant, but overall, overall, I would say that, um, uh, as you said, we live in a we live in a society that has never been more connected physically by technology than than we are today, and yet, as a society, uh, we've rarely been as disconnected, which has been demonstrated many times over the last twelve months with various elections and other things that have taken place. Um, and you know we are quite a disconnected world and society, and but we believe that because VR is is this synchronous thing where people actually get together and talk in real time, it isn't like social networks because we believe, as, as do many others, that social networks as they exist today, Facebook, uh, Twitter, those sorts of things, promote digital narcissism. Um, you know, and the, the extreme of that is possibly the new American president, um, but they, you know, the, these things really promote digital narcissism, whereas virtual reality technologies like all of ours, they don't. They promote people just sitting and talking and sharing and being together and being in the moment together. And, and that, we believe, is, is much more powerful. Yeah, that's a really good point. And just to stick with you for a bit in terms of it being a sociable network, as you pointed out, I think there's a lot more challenges, right, with this type of network than there was when people were first adopting Facebook or MySpace or Friendster or now Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat, where A, it's a lot easier to join these narcissistic platforms, which I agree with you on. Um, but it also doesn't have the hardware requirement necessarily. So I'm really curious to pick your brains each and we can start um, on that end this time. What you think the biggest challenges are that your company is facing? Uh, well, the, the biggest challenge, I won't speak for other companies, but the biggest challenge our company and the vast majority of companies I know in virtual reality is facing uh, is survival um, until such time as any of us can actually make some money out of this. Um, and again, I won't speak for anybody else, but I'll certainly speak for, for, for VTime. Um, you know, any commercialization that we do plan to do with VTime, the vast majority of it is reliant on um, reach and distribution and a large user base, which is therefore dependent on hardware. So uh, that's not going to happen until 2019, 2020. We know that. We do believe it is going to happen. 
we believe it will be led by mobile. So the biggest challenge we face is survival until then. And it's, you know, uh, again, with us, that's a mixture of um, external investment, uh, commercial work that, that we're also doing, um, but making sure that we are learning lessons constantly uh, until such point as it becomes a mass market technology. And that will be driven by the actual hardware itself. Because again, last point on that, I mean, just to stress, you, many of you will remember when mobile phones were this big and, you know, I'm on the train! And that's kind of where we are today with, with VR. We're, at the, the, we're on the train equivalent. So we've a long way to go with the hardware. Another great thing about VR is, of course, if you leave a meeting, nobody can see you leave. You just take the HMD off. So, uh, <laughs> unlike, unlike here. So, there you go. Um, but anyway. That's why next year this will have to be yeah, VR we'll have as to. well to be truly meta. Um, so obviously, I, I mean, I'll, I'll join here on, on the fact that obviously it's not a, a yet a uh, uh, mass market. Now we've, we've actually done some broadcasts which have had uh, tens of thousands of users uh, live, so that's very exciting. Um, and uh, we've done, you know, obviously big events like Super Bowl, so uh, which was very exciting. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, um, it was a good game this year. It was a very good game, um, and um, and we are a little bit in different uh, space as far as like monetization because we obviously we're, are acting more as a service provider, so we're not just uh, focusing on the social. So obviously for us, uh, uh, we are. Uh, or business is really uh, already being a service provider, so we're making you know decent money. Um, but obviously, like the whole industry, obviously is, is really still in the maturing phase, um, you know. And and it's very interesting to be working with big clients that are really forward thinking, because obviously it it you know obviously that's what's going to move the industry forward. Uh, and and that's those big events that we're doing. Uh, I think are very exciting for that. It's lots of exploration, and uh, and definitely like in terms of business model, uh, we've had some really interesting you know paying customers. For example, Audi for the MLS final in the U.S. who had its car inside the app, and we've had experiences where. You can actually look at the car, you know, inside your VIP lounge, and it takes you to the commercial for the car, a 360 experience or something. So it gets very interesting because suddenly, like, you can have very interactive advertisement and very immersive, very like up close and personal sort of advertisement experiences. And I think that's this was if you were in the panel before this was mentioned you know like there's a lot more time that the user will spend i mean we've been very surprised in how much time people spend we've had sometimes you know like average time of like 12 minutes for some games or, or more uh which you know if you think of vr and some of the device are not optimal really uh today uh is actually pretty huge and you know gets comparable to ott platforms basically in terms of uh, viewing time Great. And did Audi, how particular were they about how it looked? Like, did they give tons of critique? Did they provide the image? I just find it interesting to see how, you know, at a convention they can come and look and inspect the car, but how do they make sure it's up to par and not like? It's a good question. I actually wasn't involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, the, I know, I think it was 3D artists actually built that entirely. Yeah. Uh, we rarely get, like, uh, we usually create everything ourselves because uh, it's usually too hard or too slow to get 3D models from clients. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that. They're, we have really talented people. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, and Jane. Yeah, I would say one of the biggest challenges for me is just describing what social VR is and why it's different from other types of VR. I think downstairs, for example, you're going to see a lot different experiences than what you saw in our videos just now. A lot of people assume VR is 360 or games and social VR is, is, is completely different and every experience is different and you have to try it to actually understand why it's different. So I think sometimes when you go to a potential partner and they're like, oh, VR, yeah, I've tried it. I've tried Google Cardboard for like two minutes and like I watched this sizzle thing and, it, and then they'll like be like, okay, I got it. And that's not quite it. So there's another piece of the pitch which often is best suited when you do a demo, right? So, um, and that demo is just like a, l a little, another step of like getting them on, in a VR headset to really making them you know a real believer and that was 
kind of similar when we first started talking to NBC News. They they were like, oh, we've done 360 VR. We actually paid someone and made a bunch of 360 videos, and we we're like, okay, great. So try ours um, and see how it's different. And they're like, oh wow, this is completely different. This is true VR. So that was our experience, and it's very similar with a lot of other partners. If they're you know if they've tried VR, it's usually a different flavor from social VR. Makes sense. And yeah, this is all super interesting. I think uh, you're right downstairs is a completely kind of different vibe, not a bad or nor good, just completely different from what we're talking about. Um, so we have a couple of minutes before we go outside. Um, if anybody has any questions, well, there's a lot of light in my eyes, so I'll try to see everyone. But yes. And just to repeat the question in case no one here, which TV networks and sports are you working with in Europe? So we've done some work uh, and sometime privately, but with uh, Sky uh, England, uh, Sky Germany, uh, Telecom Cup, um, La Liga, we've done the Classico, uh, we've done uh, probably a bunch that I'm forgetting, Roland Garros before this year, uh, and uh, probably a few others I'm forgetting. And the other question. How many connected uh, users uh, were uh, during the Roland Garros event uh, were in, uh, real, uh, w in virtual reality? So Roland Garros, uh, I think what in time? <laughs> no, uh, it wasn't public. So uh, Roland Garros last year was just, w or actually two years ago, in 2015, we did a demo. We were at the RG Lab, which is like a little demo space at Roland Garros in the village. Uh, and it was just one game that we'd recorded and we're showcasing it. So it was like 1% at the time, which is why I'm making that joke. 100% um, usage. <laughs> exactly. Every time. Um, and, and, but that was what led the discussions later to where we're at today. Uh, so this was, you know, obviously there's been a lot of educating the market basically um, over the last uh, two years. And really, especially the last year, was a lot of proof concept and really like building up a strategy with a lot of broadcasters about how they want to bring their sports properties uh, there. And this week, if anyone has World Cup uh, rights, uh, there's a WMB, WBM1 and uh, very interesting talks over there. Uh, so, Thank you. And yes, there is another question. And then after this question, we'll be outside and let the schedule continue. Thanks. My question is for Julian. You mentioned um, survival until you guys can figure out a way to make money being one of the biggest challenges in VR. In your opinion, what types of companies will survive and which companies will you know, essentially run out of runway? Um, I, I think overall, so I, I was at a, at, um, I was on a panel at VRX in in uh, San Francisco just before Christmas, and one of the leading VCs uh, in VR, uh, once one of the leading venture capitalists, basically said, if you're 30 people today, you're going to be 30 people in 2019. You know, you're not going to be growing your team massively, you're not going to be making huge changes. Uh, so I think that's number one. I think the kind of companies who will survive are. Companies like all of ours that, that have already got something out there that, that is proven and working. Uh, people who keep their burn rate really you know, low, stay very, very lean, stay very, very agile. Um, as I say, our, we're funded through a mixture of investment and, and commercial work, and we'll continue to do that. So I think companies may have to look at taking on commercial projects that they wouldn't normally take on, but, but we'll keep the lights on. Uh, until such time as it's a, a, a mass market. But I don't want to paint a glum picture about this. It, it will get there. It will be huge. Um, honestly believe that, and, and we believe it will be led by mobile. So, you know, you just got to keep going and, and, and you'll be there. Thank you. And on that note, let's give a big round of applause to our panelists.